I call the Prime Minister to answer the engagement question from Vicky Foxgrove. Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, as we approach the third anniversary this coming Sunday of the Grenfell Tower tragedy, I know that the whole House would wish to join me in sending our heartfelt sympathies and thoughts to the families and friends of the 72 people who lost their lives and to the survivors. Across Government, we remain committed to ensuring that such a tragedy can never happen again. Mr Speaker, members uh, from across the House will want to join me in offering our very best wishes to His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh on his 99th birthday. And I'm sure, Mr Speaker, the whole House will also want to join me in wishing you, Mr Speaker, a very happy birthday. This morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others in addition to my duties in this House. I shall have further such meetings later today. Thank you, Thank you for all the kind regards. We're going across to Vicky Foxcroft. Vicky Foxcroft. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. As a shielded person, I'm grateful to once again contribute to Parliament. Many shielded people have contacted me, worried about government guidance on going for walks. They want a safe hour walk for shielded people, similar to that adopted in many other countries. Will he do that? They also want more transparency on the shielding list with each category named and risk published. Will he provide that? And finally, will he agree to review the furlough scheme so shielded people in the future are not penalised? Minister. Uh, yes, Mr. Sp uh, Mr Speaker, I can tell the Honourable uh, Lady that we, we certainly will be doing as much as we can in the near future to ensure uh, shielded people get guidance about how they can uh, come out of their, uh, their shielded environment safely uh, in a way that is, is COVID secure. And on her point about furlough, it's a very important one, and uh, clearly newly shielded people uh, may be asking themselves whether they will be entitled uh, to furlough uh, funds. I've been made, made aware of the issue very recently. I can assure her that we will be addressing it forthwith. Yeah. Thank you, sir. The threat and breach of the Sino-British Joint Declaration for Hong Kong is just the latest evidence of China's increasingly overt rejection of the rules of international fair play. The Communist Party of China expresses derision for the West's short-termism and lack of unity, so let's prove them wrong. Would my right honourable friend consider publishing a consultation paper for the development of a long-term strategy for our national and pan-national engagement with China? Minister. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, perhaps it would be helpful in advance of any consultation paper if I just set out my own uh, broad position and stress that I am a, a, a Sinophile and I believe that we must continue to work with this great and, and rising uh, power. But when we have oh, on climate change or trade or whatever it happens to be, uh, but when we have serious concerns uh, as a country, uh, we must, uh, whether it's over uh, the origins of, of COVID or the protection of our critical national infrastructure, or, or indeed over what is happening in Hong Kong, then we must feel absolutely free to raise those issues uh, loud and clear uh, with Beijing, and that is what uh, we will continue to do. Leader of the Opposition, Sir Keir Stott. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I join the Prime Minister on his comments on Grenfell, a dreadful night, and his comments on the Duke of Edinburgh, and, of course, his best wishes to you, Mr Speaker. Can I also say I listened carefully to what the Prime Minister just said on furlough for those newly shielding, and can I welcome that? That has been something we've been concerned about. We'll look at the proposal when it's put on the table, but I'm grateful that he's listened to that and for what he said this morning. Um, the Prime Minister, Mr Speaker, on Monday said that feelings of black and minority ethnic groups about discrimination are founded on a cold reality. I agree with him about that. There have been at least seven reports into racial inequality in the last three years alone, but precious little action. For example, most of the recommendations in the Lamy report into inequality in the criminal justice system have yet to be implemented three years after the report was published. Similarly, the long-delayed and damning report by Wendy Williams into the Windrush scandal has yet to be implemented. I spoke last night to black community leaders, and they had a very clear message for the Prime Minister. Implement the reports you've already got. So can the Prime Minister now turbocharge 
the Government's responses and tell us when he'll implement in full the Lamy report on the Windrush recommendations. Prime Minister. Well, I, I'm, I'm grateful to the uh, right honourable gentleman, but, and uh, of course I uh, understand, as I said, I understand the very strong and legitimate feelings of people in this country at the death of, of George Floyd, and of course I agree that uh, Black Lives Matter, and uh, we are getting on with the implementation, uh, not just of the Lamy report, but also the report into, into Windrush, for instance, on uh, the Lamy report, which, I, which I th- this government commissioned, of which I thank the uh, Honourable Member for Tottenham, uh, we are increasing already the number of uh, black and minority ethnic people in uh, the prison service, as David Lamy uh, recommended. We are uh, increasing the use of body-worn uh, cameras, and uh, we are trying to ensure, um, amongst other things, that uh, young BME people are not immediately prosecuted as a result of uh, the trouble uh, they find themselves in, and we try uh, to make sure that we uh, give people a chance. But I must stress that on the Lamy report uh, and on uh, all these matters, it is absolutely vital at the same time uh, that we keep our streets safe and that we back our police. And that is what we are going to do. Keir Starmer. Mr Speaker, I welcome what the Prime Minister says about implementing the reports and obviously we'll hold him to it. He will appreciate that people do notice when recommendations are made and then not implemented. So it's very important um, that they are implemented in accordance with those reports. Um, Mr Speaker, the latest report um, is the Public Health England report on the disproportionate impact of COVID-19. That report concluded that death rates are highest amongst black and Asian ethnic groups. And it went on to say, and this was the important bit, that it's already clear that relevant guidance and key policies should be adapted to mitigate the risk. Already clear. If it is already clear that guidance and policy need to be changed, why has the government not already acted? Mr Speaker, not only already clear, but we are already acting. And uh, I can tell him that what we are doing, as a result of the uh, report by Professor Fenton, which again uh, we uh, commissioned, uh, we are looking at the particular exposure of black and minority ethnic groups to coronavirus, and be in no doubt they've been at the forefront of the struggle against uh, coronavirus, whether it's in the NHS or in public transport. 44% of the NHS in London, uh, where London workforce is black and minority ethnic uh, workers, and that is why what we are doing uh, first and most uh, directly is to ensure that those high contact professions uh, get expanded and targeted testing now. And that's what I've agreed uh, with Dido Harding from NHS uh, Test and Trace. I think that's the first and most practical step we can take as a result of Professor Fenton's report. Here's yeah. Starbuck. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And, uh, uh, the Prime Minister, I know, understands the frustration from those most at risk when they see a report like that uh, and they know action is needed. And action is needed now, not in a few weeks or months. So can I ask the Prime Minister to complete... Well, perhaps the Prime Minister will indicate whether that's all of the action or whether there's more action. This is a serious issue. We can make progress together. Um, but it is important that it's done uh, swiftly for those most at risk. Yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, I want to turn to the overall numbers of those that have tragically died... Um, from COVID-19, because those overall numbers haunt us. Since last Prime Minister's questions, the Government's daily total figure for those that have died from coronavirus has gone past 40,000. The ONS figure, which records cases where coronavirus is on the death certificate, stands at just over 50,000. And the number of excess deaths, which is an awful phrase, stands at over 63,000. These are amongst the highest numbers anywhere in the world. Last week, the Prime Minister said he was proud of the government's record. But there's no pride in those figures, is there? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, let, let me just say that uh, on the death figures for this country, uh, we mourn everyone and we, uh, we grieve for, for them and for their for their relatives and their friends. But I must also tell him, and he's, he's raised this point repeatedly across the, uh, across the dispatch box, the, the best scientific evidence and advice is that we must wait until the 
epidemic has been uh, through its whole cycle in order to draw uh, the relevant uh, international uh, comparisons. And that, I'm afraid, I'm, I simply must repeat that, that point to him. And as for the, uh, what this country did to fight the epidemic, I must say I strongly disagree uh, with the way he characterises it. I think it was an astonishing achievement of the NHS uh, to, to build the Nightingale hospitals. I think it was an astonishing thing that this country came together to drive down, to follow the social distancing rules, in spite of all the doubt that was cast on uh, the advice, to follow those rules, to get uh, the number of deaths down, to get the epidemic under control in the way that we have. And this government has announced a plan uh, on May the 11th uh, to uh, get our country back onto its feet, and that is what we are going to do. We, are follow we have a plan, we're following it, and we're going to stick to it. Yeah. Starmer. Mr Speaker, it just doesn't wash to say that we can't compare these figures to other countries. Everybody can see those figures and see the disparity. And we need to learn from those other countries. What did they do more quickly than us? What did they do differently to us? Because we can learn those lessons uh, and ensure that the numbers come down. And it's little solace to the families that have lost someone to simply be told this is too early uh, to compare and to learn from other countries. And, of course, there will be long-term consequences as a result of the government's approach. I want to turn now to another aspect of government policy, and that's school reopening. We all want as many children back into school as soon as it's possible and as soon as it's safe. What that required for that to happen was a robust national plan, consensus among all key stakeholders and strong leadership from the top. All three are missing. The current arrangements lie in tatters. Parents have lost confidence in the government's approach. Millions of children will miss six months' worth of schooling, and inequality will now go up. Several weeks ago, I suggested to the Prime Minister that we set up a national task force so everybody could put their shoulder to the wheel. It's not too late. Will the Prime Minister take me up on this? Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, as, uh, I, as, I, as I told the House before, uh, I've been in contact with the uh, Right Honourable Gentleman by a modern device called the telephone, uh, in which we've... Uh, we've tried to agree a way forward, which he's then seemed to deviate from uh, later on. Uh, last week, he, last week he, was telling the, he was telling the House uh, that it was, it was not yet safe for kids to go back to school. Uh, this week, he's saying that uh, not enough kids are going back uh, to school. I, think, I really think he needs, to, he needs to make up his mind. And since he's so fond of these uh, international comparisons, he should know uh, that there are some countries in, uh, in the EU, in Europe, where uh, no primary school kids are going back to school. I think... Uh, and, and uh, we are being extremely cautious in our approach. We're following uh, the plan uh, that we, we set out. And I think that the people of this country uh, will want uh, to, to follow it. And, they, and uh, the, all the evidence says 97% of the schools that have submitted data are now uh, seeing kids come back to school. And I think what we'd like to hear from the right honourable gentleman is a bit of support uh, for that and a bit of encouragement uh, to pupils and perhaps even encouragement to some of his friends in the left wing uh, trades unions uh, to help get our schools ready. Yes, have this out. The Prime Minister and I have never discussed our letter in any phone call. He knows it and I know it. The task force has never been the subject of a conversation between him and me one to one or in any other circumstance on the telephone. He knows it. So please drop that. Um, secondly, he mentions other countries. Plenty of other comparable countries are getting their children back to school. Wales is an example. Across Europe there are other examples. We're the outlier on this. And it's no good, Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister flailing around trying to blame others. Order, order. But we need to get through with lots of other members so if we can listen to the question, then I certainly want to hear the answers. Kirsten. Mr Speaker, I was saying it's no good the Prime Minister flailing around trying to blame others. A month ago today, a month ago today, he made the announcement about schools without consulting relevant parties, without warning about the dates and without any scientific backing for his proposal. It's time he took responsibility for his own failures. This mess was completely avoidable. The consequences are stark. The Children's Commissioner has warned of a deepening education disadvantage gap. And she spoke yesterday, her words, the Children's Commissioner, an emerging picture which doesn't give confidence that there's a strategic plan. 
She called for the government to scale up their response. It must have occurred. It must have occurred to the government that space would be a problem, that there would be a need for temporary accommodation and classrooms. They built the Nightingale hospitals. Why are they only starting on schools now? Mr Speaker, he still can't work out whether he's he's saying schools are not safe enough or or whether we should be going back more quickly. I mean, he he, he can't have it both ways, Mr Speaker. It's, it's, It's one brief... One brief one day, another brief next. I know I, I understand how the legal profession works, but what the public want to have, what the public want to have, is some consistency, Mr. Speaker. And uh, w- what I what I hope that he will agree with uh, with me is that it's a good thing that we've now got 37% of kids in year six in our primary schools uh, coming back. That, that is increasing the whole time. And what I think the message that uh, I think that teachers want to hear across the country is that all parliamentarians in this uh, House of Commons support the return of kids to school and furthermore that they are encouraging kids to come back to school because it is safe. Will he now say that? Keir Starmer I want as many children to go back to school as possible as soon as possible, as quickly as possible when it's safe. I've been saying that like a like a broken record for weeks on end. I know, he's, I know the Prime Minister's got rehearsed attack lines, um, but uh, he should look at what I wrote from this letter and what I've been saying consistently. Mr Speaker, one way, one way in which the government could help those worst affected would be to extend the national voucher scheme. Because child poverty numbers are so high in this country, 1.3 million children in low-income families rely on these vouchers. They mean children who can't go to school because of coronavirus restrictions still get free meals. The Labour government in Wales has said it will continue to fund these meals through the summer. Yesterday, the Education Secretary said that won't be the case in England. That's just wrong, and it will lead to further inequality. So can I urge the Prime Minister to reconsider on this point. Right Minister. What I can tell the right honourable gentleman is, of course, uh, we don't normally continue with free school meals over the summer holidays, but we are also, of course, uh, and and I'm sure that's right, we're also, of course, aware of the particular difficulties faced by uh, vulnerable families, and that's why we're announcing a further £63 million of uh, local welfare assistance to be used by local authorities at their discretion to help the most vulnerable families, Mr Speaker. Uh, and, and, and th- th- this government has put its arms around the people of this country throughout this crisis and has done its absolute best, has done its absolute best to help, has done its absolute best to help. And I may say it is not helped by the wobbling and turgiversation of the, of the, of the Labour Party and the gentleman opposite. First he says, it's, last week he says it's not safe, uh, this week he says uh, we're not going uh, fast enough. Uh, we protected the NHS, Mr Speaker, we provided huge numbers of ventilated beds. Uh, we're now getting the disease under control, but we will do it in a cautious and uh, contingent way. And today I will be announcing further measures to uh, open up our society and uh, to unlock our society, but only because of the huge efforts and the sacrifice that uh, this country has made. We're sticking to our plan of May the 11th. And we're sticking to our plan. It's a plan that is working and will continue to work, Mr Speaker, with or without the assistance of the Right Honourable Gentleman opposite. Alan Mack. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Britain's new advanced research projects agency is vital to securing our status as a science and technology superpower, particularly as we recover from coronavirus. Can my right honourable friend commit to protecting its funding and its independence so there are no obstacles to it delivering transformational breakthroughs from clean energy to new vaccines? Prime yes. Minister. Uh, yes, and I thank my honourable friend, and he's absolutely right. We will be having an advanced research projects agency funded to the tune of £800 million, and it will be tasked with uh, supporting uh, really revolutionary breakthroughs in this country, because uh, it, it was the UK from splitting the, the atom uh, to uh, the jet engine to the internet that has led the world in scientific research, and under this government we intend to continue. We are now going heading up into Scotland to the leader of the SNP, Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And can I associate myself with the remarks of the Prime Minister on Grenfell, of course, on the birthday of the Duke of Edinburgh and yourself? And, Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister told the Liaison Committee, I do not actually read the scientific papers. It is no wonder then, Mr Speaker, 
that it took the UK so long to act on quarantine measures. The Prime Minister's scientific advisory group weren't even asked for advice on this significant policy. This has been a complete shambles. Too little, too late. We cannot risk ignoring the experts once again. Can the Prime Minister confirm what scientific papers he has read on the two-metre social distance rule? Prime Minister. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, I, I must say I'm, I, I disagree with my I've read a huge amount about uh, a, a disease that affects our entire nation. I can, I've read many papers, actually, on the, on the social distancing rule, and it's a very interesting point. And uh, I think members across the House of Commons uh, will want uh, to understand that I believe that those measures, the two-metre rule, need now to be kept under review. As we drive this disease down, as we get the incidents down, working uh, together, I want to make sure that we keep that two-metre rule under constant review, because as uh, the Right Honourable Gentleman, I think, indicates, there is all sorts of scientific advice about that particular matter. Ian Blackford, Sec Thank you, Mr Speaker. Of course, we know that the Cabinet has discussed reducing the two-metre social distancing rule, but that's not the experts' advice right now. Sage reported that being exposed to the virus for six seconds at one metre is the same as being exposed for one minute at two metres. That, Mr Speaker, is a significant increase in risk. And the last time Professor Whitty was allowed to attend the daily press briefing, he stressed that the two metre rule was going to be necessary for as long as the pandemic continues. People are losing confidence in this government. A U-turn on schools, a shambolic rollout of quarantine measures, and now looking to reduce the two-metre rule far too soon. Will the Prime Minister continue to ignore the experts, or will he start following the advice of those who have actually read the scientific papers? Prime Minister. Well, actually, Mr Speaker, the people of this country are overwhelmingly following the guidance that this government gives. And uh, tomorrow, Mr Speaker, you'll be hearing, the House will be hearing a bit more about uh, what's happened with NHS Test and Trace. And they will find an extraordinary degree of natural compliance, natural understanding by the British people, in spite of all the, the obscurantism and the myth-making uh, that we've heard from the, from the party, uh, parties opposite. And I, I can, I can uh, tell the right honourable gentleman uh, that there are all sorts of views about the two-metre rule. He's absolutely correct in what he says about the sage advice. But clearly, as the incidence of the disease comes down, as I think uh, members of SAGE uh, would confirm, the statistical likelihood of being infected, no matter how close or far you are from somebody who may or may not have coronavirus, uh, goes down. Peter Aldis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Allowing zoos such as Africa Alive near Lowestoft to reopen from 15th June is very good news, as it provides them with a realistic chance of survival. Would the Prime Minister give full consideration to allowing beer gardens to also reopen from 15th June, as the feedback which I'm receiving is that many pubs are now facing the unpalatable and unwanted prospect of having to make staff redundant. Yes. Prime Minister. Uh, I thank my honourable friend very much because he's absolutely right. We want to uh, reopen hospitality as quickly as we possibly can. The House will remember that according to the roadmap, uh, we were going to open uh, outdoor host hospitality no, uh, no earlier than uh, July the 4th. That is still the plan. We are sticking uh, to our plan. Uh, what, and so guidance is now being developed for, uh, for such hospitality. Uh, what we don't want to see uh, is a, a roiling Bracanalian uh, massive of people uh, that can spread uh, the disease. So it's very important that people understand the continuing risks that this country faces. Sir so Geoffrey Donaldson. The Prime Minister will be aware that the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland has today published the guidelines for the special payment scheme for severely injured victims linked to the troubles in Northern Ireland. The Prime Minister will also know that this House passed legislation which excludes those injured by their own hand. But the innocent victims have not yet been able to benefit from this scheme, not least because of the actions of Sinn Féin, who are blocking the next steps to implementation. Will the Prime Minister and his Government 
now commit to do all that they can to move this matter forward so that our most vulnerable of innocent victims can receive this pension. Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, uh, yes, indeed, Mr Speaker. I think this scheme uh, provides a fair, balanced and uh, proportionate way of helping all those who suffered most during the, the Troubles. And uh, it's very important that Sinn Féin, along uh, with all other parties, uh, allow the scheme to go forward as soon as possible. Ray Miller. Mr Speaker, many peaceful protests have been held across the country against racism following the appalling events in the US, including in my own constituency yesterday. Can I commend my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, for recognising the significance of these events and as well as scrutinising the health impact of C-19 on ethnic minority groups, can he look again, using the race disparity audit, for any persistent and systemic racism in all government departments, from the treatment of BAME uh, people in the judicial system, through to how we teach children about these issues in our education system? Yeah. Minister. Well, I, 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 thank, I, I thank her, and I completely agree with the need for uh, all political uh, leaders to uh, to, pr to promote uh, these issues, to, to recognise how important they are in, in people's hearts, and uh, we will continue. I'm very proud of what I did as, uh, as mayor to encourage the promotion of, uh, of, of young BAME uh, officers in our, in our metropolitan police. We had a, we had a system to, uh, to move them up. Uh, I want to see that kind of activity across the government uh, of this country. It's the right way forward for the UK. We turn it to Scotland with Kirsty Blackman. Kirsty Blackman. Mr Speaker, the response from the US President to the death of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter movement has been horrendous. Can the Prime Minister confirm to me if he still believes Trump has many, many good qualities? And if so, what are they? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, um, uh, I, I, I renew what I have said many times, but it's important for the House to hear it again. Uh, yes, Black Lives Matter, and yes, the death of, uh, of George Floyd was absolutely appalling. And as for the, uh, the qualities of, the, uh, of, of, of Mr Trump, let me say he has, amongst many other things, he is President of the United States, which is our, which is our most important ally in the world today. And whatever people may say about it, whatever those on the left may say about it, the United States is a bastion of, of peace and freedom and has been for most of my lifetime. Part of the House of Peter Bottomley. Mr Speaker, I hope you'll allow me to ask the Prime Minister also to welcome the birthday of the Primate of England, the 2007 Yorkshireman of the Year, the Archbishop of York, who's just laying down his crozier after 14 years of service. His great words were that we can share the glories, the struggles, the joys and the pains of this country. Remember that John Sentamu was tortured in Uganda and served in Tulse Hill, Stepney, Birmingham, as well as York, and was a critical, critical advisor to the Stephen Lawrence Inquiry. Can I put it to my right honourable friend that if in a period of eight years there are eight interrogations of a bishop each time John sent a move, we've got more to learn about making the colour of one's skin as important as the colour of one's eyes and the colour of one's hair, something you may notice but doesn't tell you any more about them. Mr. Uh, well, I, I join him uh, warmly in paying tribute to uh, the Archbishop of York as he lays down uh, his crozier. He's, uh, uh, I, he and I correspond uh, very often. I, I, I take his advice and, uh, very sincerely, and uh, I had no idea that today was such a distinguished birthday, Mr Speaker. Shabbat day. Mr Speaker, under suspicionless stop and search powers, which this government is expanding, a black person is 47 times more likely to be stopped and searched than a white person. 47 times. On too many occasions, stop and search seems to mean being black is enough to be suspected of being a criminal. So will the Prime Minister abolish suspicionless stop and search powers and end the pain and injustice they wreak on so many people in Britain's black and minority communities? Well, Prime Minister. 
Uh, Mr Speaker, it's very important that stop and search is carried out sensitively uh, in accordance with the law. It, it has made a great difference to the way it happens that we now have uh, body-worn cameras, but I must say I do think that uh, it can be a very important, Section 60 uh, powers can be very important in, in fighting uh, violent crime. And uh, it is, I, I'm afraid to, that what has been happening in London with, the, with, with knife crime has been completely unacceptable. And I do believe that stop and search, amongst many other things, can be a very important utensil of fighting uh, knife crime. It does work. It worked for us when uh, I was running London, and it must work now. It's, it's, I'm not saying it's the whole answer. He's right. It's not the whole answer, but it's part of the mix. We're now heading up to the County Palatine of Lancashire with Mark Menzies. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, hospitality and tourism businesses on the Foyle Coast are concerned about their part of long-term recovery and the infrastructure needed to support that. Centrally to this locally is the M55 Link Road, a project which was fully funded and had an issue with some funding allocations. Can the Prime Minister put his weight behind this and help me secure the £5.7 million needed to complete the shovel-ready project? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, what I can say is that we will unite and level up with infrastructure projects uh, across our country and uh, I congratulate him in, in, in his lobbying uh, for this particular scheme and I can tell him that uh, last year we put £31 million for the Preston a Western distributor scheme, which is a new dual carriageway that will reduce congestion in Preston and directly lead to the creation of over 3,000 houses and over 500 jobs. And uh, as for further expansion of the M55, uh, uh, he will have to wait, but there will be further announcements in due course. We're now heading up into Scotland with Stuart Malcolm MacDonald. Stuart Malcolm MacDonald. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Even before the pandemic began, it was clear that the UK has one of the most manifestly inadequate systems of statutory sick pay in the world. We are the second from the bottom in European terms, and it continues to shun millions of workers who are low earners, work in the gig economy, or are self-employed. So as we go back from the crisis in economic terms and make the workplace better, well, the Prime Minister agreed to work with those of us in the opposition fit for the 21st century that can meet people's needs. Prime Minister. Um, uh, yes, Mr Speaker, and, uh, and uh, we, will, uh, we, will, we will make sure uh, that uh, those who uh, do not have... The, yes, of course, uh, statutory sick pay is an important part of of the way we uh, tackle uh, the problems of, of uh, self isolation and all the issues that are faced by people facing coronavirus. But people also receive additional funds. I think anybody looking impartially at uh, what we're doing to support the people of this country uh, throughout this epidemic will concede that the UK has done more than virtually any other country on earth to look after uh, the people of this country, whether through uh, the furloughing scheme or the bounce back loans or, 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 or anything else. And uh, listening to him just now, uh, I've also pledged that we are going to put in uh, gigabit broadband across the whole of the UK so that he can be heard uh, more clearly in future. Heading up to the border of Manchester and Lancashire with Mark Logan. Prime Minister, we've seen much disinformation about the R value in Bolton and the North West. If we have increasingly up to date local data, would the Prime Minister then agree with me that correspondingly greater confidence will be given to Boltonians in reopening our businesses, schools, and places of worship? Prime Minister. Uh, yes, Mr Speaker, and that's why uh, I am encouraged by NHS Test and Trace and the, the progress that it is making, and with the help of the Joint Biosecurity Centre, uh, we're able now to identify hotspots to, to do whack-a-mole and to, uh, to stamp out on uh, outbreaks of the epidemic uh, where they occur. Returning to Scotland with Kenny McCaskill. Kenny McCaskill. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, East Lothian prides itself on its food and drink sector, which is gravely threatened by reduced standards in animal welfare and production. Uh, the government failed to enshrine protections in the Agriculture Bill. Earlier this week, ministers equivocated on this issue. Will the Prime Minister now take this opportunity to be clear today that high standards will be protected, a Food Standards Commission will be established, and that we won't face chlorinated chicken on our table? along with Kentucky Fried Medicine in our hospitals. 
Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, not only will we uh, protect animal welfare standards, but we will be able, uh, on leaving the EU as we have, we will be able to uh, increase our animal welfare standards. Uh, we will be able to ban uh, treatment of farrowing sows uh, that is currently uh, legal in the EU. We will be able to ban the shipment of live animals, which we currently cannot ban uh, in, the, in the UK. We will be able to go further, and I, hope, ben, and I hope, by the way, uh, that he supports it, and I hope he'll tell all his friends in the SNP, is it? Uh, I hope he'll tell all his friends in the, in the SNP that that is one of the reasons uh, why uh, their plan uh, to take Scotland back into the EU would be completely contrary to the instincts of the British people. Robert Mr Speaker, due to Covid, we are facing a unique economic challenge. Can I urge the Prime Minister to respond with a major package of infrastructure investment to create jobs and level up the whole country, including turbocharging the rollout of gigabit broadband, upgrading the Manchester to Sheffield line, and finally building the full Mottram bypass. The people of Glossop have been promised this by politicians for over 50 years. We'll even let him call it the Boris bypass. Let's please just get it built. And he could use his bike. Come on, Prime Minister. OK, well, uh, thank you so much. And my, 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 my honourable friend, I can confirm briefly to my honourable friend that we are indeed uh, committed under the road investment strategy published uh, last year to building a bypass around Mottram, and I look forward to uh, being there to see it done. Rachel Hopkins. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My constituents tell me they have lost trust in the government as they are confused by mixed messaging around public health measures, angry that Dominic Cummings seems to have been let off the hook, but they are particularly worried about local jobs and livelihoods due to inadequate support schemes, lack of crisis funding for Luton Council, illogical quarantine impacting Luton Airport. All of this has been on your watch, Prime Minister. How can my constituents feel confident on the proposed next steps for easing lockdown when your government has fallen short so far? Because I think the British public, with their overwhelming common sense, have ignored uh, some of the uh, propaganda that we've been hearing from uh, the party opposite uh, about our advice. They've ignored uh, the negativity and the attempts uh, to confuse, and they are overwhelmingly uh, following advice. And indeed, uh, they are uh, complying uh, with NHS Test and Trace, which is the way forward uh, which will enable us uh, to defeat this virus both locally and nationally. Stuart Anderson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Pre-COVID, the Prime Minister has made a firm commitment to reach into some of the most deprived areas and level up the country. This is needed now more than ever. Will he make a firm commitment and recommit to Whitmarines, Chapel Ash, Penfields and the rest of Wolverhampton so they won't just survive, they will thrive? Yeah. Minister. Uh, yes, uh, Mr Speaker, I certainly will. I, I, I congratulate my honourable friend on the way he represents Wolverhampton and the many campaigns that he fights uh, for that great city and I can tell him uh, that uh, just as for starters that Wolverhampton will benefit from around 270 million of the growth deal funding across the black country which aims to uh, create 5,000 jobs, 1,400 new homes and 310 million in public and private uh, investment, just for starters. Final question, Olivia. And many happy returns, Mr Speaker. Today they say that we are free just to be ch uh, only to be chained in poverty. Figures, not my words, the words of Bob Marley in 1973. Figures from the Trussell Trust show an 89% increase in emergency food parcels across the UK in April, compared to the same last, month, uh, month last year. People are struggling and they need help now. Will the Prime Minister meet with the Chancellor, charities and local government leaders to discuss the, a much needed funding boost for local welfare assistance schemes in England. Prime Minister. Well, I, I mean, the, 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 the Honourable Lady is absolutely right. This country is going through a very difficult uh, crisis, a public health crisis, uh, an economic crisis, and of course it's put many families to, to great hardship. Uh, I think the government has done a huge amount to look after families across the country. Uh, we put, as she knows, £3.2 billion pounds more into, uh, into local government. And I announced uh, earlier on today, just now, that we're also putting another £63 million pounds into uh, extra welfare support for particularly disadvantaged families to help with, uh, uh, with, to help with uh, meals uh, throughout the summer period. But she's entirely right. We face a, a huge economic uh, problem. 
problem. That's why we need to get moving, uh, get this country going forward uh, together, and workers, parliamentarians, and politicians uh, to communicate to the public jointly what we're doing. In order to allow the safe exit of honourable members participating in this item of business and safe arrival of those participating in the next, I am now suspending the House for three minutes. Thank you.